Hello, good morning, everyone. I hope you all had a restful engagement week last week and you kind of recharge a little bit. Um, and so we do have a quiz on Wednesday. Uh, information is, of course, posted online already, and that is only going to be on um, lecture five, um, which is the action potential stuff, right, with the with the neurons um, and uh, uh, synaptic communication and all those things. Um, so, you know, if, if, if you need uh, help, please feel free to email me. Uh, but it's just what that one one lecture. And uh, today we will be doing lecture six, which is the second part of the nervous system. Um, and we will be um, looking, uh, taking a closer look at the central nervous system. Okay, so um, the structure and organization of the spinal cord, um, different parts of the brain and, and the different lobes and their functions. Uh, we'll open up the brains and take a look at um, deeper structures that are inside the brain and, of course, talk about their functions as well. And uh, that's why I have a new virtual background. It's a brain. It looks a little bit more exciting and relevant <laughs> to what we're doing. Um, and so, yeah, let's get started. Okay, we're going to be going back and forth um, uh, between the powerpoints and the uh, and the, and the study guide quite a bit today, more more than we usually do, uh, just because there's so many diagrams um, that we need to fill in and label. So um, make sure you do have the study guide um, uh, handy uh, and close and near you, so that we can make the transition uh, easily. So let's get started with this lecture six: nervous system. Part two. You know, like I told you, right? Uh, last unit, each um, unit there tends to be a particularly challenging lecture. Last unit was um, the immune system, right? Um, and I think this one, generally, people find it to be the most um, challenging for the second unit, just because there are so many parts of the brain that you have to learn the names and, you know, remember the functions. And there are some concepts that are a little bit obscure. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we might not be able to finish with, uh, with, with just this week. You know, we'll see how it goes in uh, play by year. So um, my face is always in the way with some of these things. Uh, but basically, the central nervous system, as you know by now, you should know by now, is made up of the brain and the spinal cord, okay? And um, within the brain and the spinal cord, there are kind of two types of uh, tissues that makes up um, uh, these uh, structures. And, and we call them white matter as well as gray matter. So white matter, is literally whitish in color, not like you know, white white like snow, okay, but but more like a like an ivory with a with a hint of gray to it, okay, very light um, uh, grayish color, okay, uh, but but mostly white, so we call that white matter, and that white um, uh, color is caused by uh, the myelination, okay, you might remember the myelin is um, important because it speeds up signal transduction. Okay, and, and you might also remember in the central nervous system, um, there are these uh, oligodendrocytes that are responsible for forming uh, the myelin okay, that wraps around the axon. Okay, and then when you put them together in a bundle, we call them tracks. Okay, so white matter is primarily these tracks that are uh, uh, um, transmitting signal either in the brain or in the spinal cord. Okay, so they're, they're whitish uh, uh, in, in color. And then there is the gray matter, okay, which uh, is much darker in, in, in coloration. It's not really gray gray though. Like um, if you actually look at it, it's more like a beige color, okay? Um, uh, like a brownish beige, okay? But people call them gray matter. And, and these are everything else that are not myelinated. So we have the cell bodies of the neurons. Um, we have some short non-myelinated fibers, okay? Um, if, the, if the axon is really short, there's no point of putting myelin on it, okay? Uh, because you're not gonna lose the signal strength 
uh, along the axon if, the, if it's really, really short. So um, there are some neurons that don't have uh, myelin, right? Like some of those interneurons that we talk about, which are in the, uh, in the CNS, um, they, they might not be uh, myelinated. Okay, uh, and the main function for gray matter is to process information. So one way to to think about this is, um, you know, I if you go to the Ashton B um, computer labs, right? Like you guys probably been to a computer lab like last semester, right? When you take that computer course online, uh, or like if you go to the library, right? Like you have all these computers, all these computers, okay, that are in the room. And then they're all connected by like cables at the back, right? Like maybe there are some Ethernet cables or some cables for printers or whatever it is, right? So each of the computers, they are kind of each of the computer, they're like the gray matter. They are the 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 processor. Okay, they they do all these um, uh, processing work, and then they communicate with each other through these um, cables, through these fibers. OK, um, so they're all on the same network. They sometimes communicate with each other. Uh, and these cables are what's connecting them um, together. OK, so white matter are just for transmitting signal for the most part, while the gray matter is for processing information. Now, I do want you to know this, um, to, to get this uh, concept into your head, um, which we'll reiterate later on for the brain, for the brain. The gray matter, gray matter. Oh, by the way, uh, some people spell gray with a uh, er, right? Um, just in case you you didn't know that, um, and it doesn't really matter. Both is okay. So gray matter uh, is on the outside for the most part in the brain, whereas the white matter, they are generally located on the inside. Okay, that's the organization in the brain. As for the spinal cord though, spinal cord, it is actually organized in the other way, where the gray matter is concentrated on the inside of the spinal cord and the white matter is on the periphery, on the outside. Okay, so just want to write that down for you. Um, so that when we, when we do label our brain and spinal cord later, you know it, it's it's going to be a familiar uh, uh, organization for you. As with many things in science in biology, uh, it's not you know always clear cut, right? Things are not always one way or the other. There are always exceptions. So these are just general rules. Okay. Gray matter is on the outside of the brain with white matter on the inside. And it's okay to find a little bit of gray matter inside the brain as well. So we're going to look at some of these um, exceptions later on as we progress through um, the lecture. Okay. All right. Next, we are going to talk about uh, some protections for our central nervous system. Um, as you know, neurons are very precious. If we damage them, we don't get them back. So it makes sense for the body to have as many protections against them, uh, against, you know, uh, damage from, from outside, as well as, um, you know, uh, potential threats from, from inside your body, right? There are chemicals in, in the blood that are not all good for the central nervous system. So you want to be able to block some of them out as well. So we will be looking at this thing called the meninges. Okay? So meninges surrounds the entire brain as well as the spinal cord. Okay? You might not have heard of meninges before, but you probably have heard of like meningitis. Right? Meningitis is the inflammation of your meninges. Okay, so rather than me reading all these things to you, um, I think we're going to go ahead and label this in the um, uh, in the uh, study guide here. Okay, so please pull yours out. Um, you know, if you go, I, I forgot what page this is, but if you if you keep on scrolling down, you will eventually find it in the diagram section. Okay, so I'm going to give you a moment to do that. If you have it, please give me a thumbs up. Uh, in the chat, so 
or like in the whatever in the there's a thumbs up icon right okay so when i see a lot of people have it um then we're going to proceed okay so this is in the um study guide just because this is uh kind of important maybe uh, i'll post a link in the chat as well for the um for this study guide you really it's it's not something that you can just um you know sit here and watch me do and uh, and learn that uh it's best if you have oh page eight thank you uh, shelly for telling us all right there we go okay so that's the uh i just i just posted it in the chat box if you, if you need a direct link to it okay there it is so um this is this is the head okay this is this is your head if you um if you if you if you take a plane and divide oh you can't really see it because of my virtual background okay let me go closer to the nope 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 okay i have to turn off my virtual background to show you uh choose virtual background none sorry i'm in a storage room there's a lot of food behind me <laughs> so if you take the uh, take the uh, uh plane and then you divide your head like this okay Okay. What what playing is this called, huh? If you, if you cut the head like this, what playing is this? Is it is it transverse? Is this frontal? Is it um, sagittal? What's this playing, huh? What what did we learn from last semester? Uh oh, uh, that's okay. If you don't remember, if you if you cut it, if you use a plane that divides the body into front and back, this is called a frontal frontal plane right so this is uh this is what you get when you uh divide um with a frontal brain a uh, front frontal plane um and uh, you're gonna uh have this uh section of the head okay so these are these are just like your hair and and over here that would be like the skin uh of your of your scalp okay so skin of scalp right there yeah these are just hair okay here now uh below your skin not just in the head like everywhere okay below your skin you have the hypodermis right, that's where your um you know a little bit of fat there connective tissue mostly right you might have some uh um uh sensors right for detecting pressure temperature and that kind of stuff so that's the hypodermis and then beneath that right this right here that is um that is bone and and what do we call the call the bone that surrounds the head do you guys know what's the name for that huh skull. the skull that's right so this is the skull um and specifically it is going to be your cranium cranium it protects the brain which is pretty pretty hard stuff okay you knock on it you can feel that it is a uh, very very hard okay all right then we're gonna zoom in a little bit okay immediately beneath this the skull beneath the cranium we are going to have our first layer of the meningi Okay. And that layer is called the dura mater. Okay, I'm going to highlight the dura mater for you. It actually is two layers. You guys see that it's two layers. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit more for you. Okay, so there's one layer here. Okay, that's the dura mater. And then beneath that is immediately another layer. Okay but the layer can separate sometimes in certain locations in the brain okay and when they do separate it creates a little pocket right like this okay so normally the dura mater is like stuck together two pieces stuck together but sometimes they open up and creates an empty space in the middle okay so let's label that first um oh i think i missed a little bit of coloring here 
There we go. Okay, so this here, that's the dura mata. Uh, it's just a single T, okay? Not not meta, it's mata, dura mata. Um, it's it's very tough, very fibrous. Like you 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 try to you try to pull on it, it's it's not gonna rip, okay? It's it's really tough. Um, I kind of know because like we we did like some brain dissections when I was in a, like university. So like the, one of the things they tell us to do is try to, you know, try to stretch on it and 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 just feel how tough and fibrous this thing is. Okay, uh, and and it's you know separate and uh, usually fused together, but sometimes it separates to form this pocket, right? So this pocket right here in the middle. Uh, let me see if I can just choose a color to highlight that. This pocket right here. Okay, that is the dural venous sinus. Okay, a sinus is basically like a cavity. Uh, a venous sinus is a cavity where you drain some kind of fluid. Okay, there are different venous sinuses in the body. You have one in your eye, for example. Um, this one is formed by the separation of the Dura mata, so it's called the dural venous sinus. Okay, so that's what this is. And the function is to drain something called cerebral spinal fluid, which we'll talk more about. Okay, but this, this fluid, this CSF, um, basically surrounds um, the outside of your central nervous system, and then you will find some of it within your central nervous system as well. We're going to talk a lot more about it later. Okay, but you got to drain that stuff. Okay, otherwise they just keep on building up and then there will be too much pressure in your brain uh, and that's not a good thing. Okay, so the dura mater is the outermost layer and, and you can see it's like one, one, one side is actually stuck to the skull, okay, to the cranium. If we are talking about the spinal cord, uh, what bone protects your spinal cord? Like we know the cranium, I just told you cranium protects the brain. What about spinal cord? What 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 bone protects the spinal cord, huh? Spine. Uh, yeah, your spine, your backbone, right? Basically, right. So, so the backbone will also uh, immediately inside the backbone, you will have your dura mater as well. Okay. Uh, next, we are going to have uh, another layer, and I know it's a little bit hard to see with this black and white um, diagram. Uh, but that's the best one I could find, uh, believe it or not. Um, and so here, right beneath it, there is this black thing, which I'm coloring blue right now. Okay. That is the arachnoid layer. Arachnoid. Matter. Let me just make it a little bit thinner so you can see better. Arachnoid means spider. Okay. okay. And that's because you can see all these white uh, lines here. They look like spider webs, right? So this is the arachnoid matter. We're going to come back to that in a bit. I'll explain what it does. And uh, but, but first, I have to show you the third layer. And the third layer, again, is really hard to see. But you just have to believe me, it's there. It's this purple one, OK? And it just follows the grooves of your brain. OK, so like goes in here like that. Okay, and then there is the other one. So this one, it kind of. follow the contours of the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, it's like putting a shrink wrap on your uh, food, okay? It just wraps tight, tightly to the structure. And, and that uh, layer right there is this particular label. That is the pia mater, pia mater. Okay, so this one uh, here, adheres closely to the brain and of course spinal cord as well okay. 
stuck to it, basically. Like shrink wrap, I keep on saying. And then, and then this here is actually the brain, the brain tissue. And you can see there's a darker color here, right? What matter is that, huh? What do you think? Is, is, is it white matter or gray matter? Do you remember what I told you? Gray matter. Gray matter. Yes, that is the gray matter. That's the thinking part. Okay, double T now, huh? Okay, so the PMR is stuck on the gray matter. And then the, the, the lighter color stuff on the inside is white matter. Okay. And again, like they're not actually gray, right? Like in real life, they are like beige color, brownish, light brown. And the white matter, if anything, that's the one that looks a little bit, you know, grayish white. Okay. White with a, with a hint of gray, I should say. Okay. I'll show you some pictures of it later. You know, you, you can decide on your own. So, so are we okay so far, right? Uh, these, these three layers uh, collectively, Right, Dura, Arachno, and Pia. That's the meninges. Meninges. Okay. So uh, there is like another arrow here, and that's pointing to all these little, little spider web stuff. Okay, that are kind of like sandwiched between the um, arachnoid matter and the PM matter. So that is called the sub arachnoid, sub arachnoid space. And this space is actually filled with CSF. Okay, so you're going to have all these CSF that are just kind of floating in between the two layers. And, and what that does is it, it kind of creates a, a cushioning layer. Okay. I, I like to think of the, um, this, this whole arrangement as like a mattress. Okay. So imagine like you're sleeping on your bed, right? The, the side that you're sleeping on, that's like the arachnoid mat. Okay. And then the underside that's like touching your bed frame, that would be like the PM mat. And in between the two layers, you have all the spring coils, right? Okay, that's what gives your bed a little bit of support and buoyancy, right? Okay, uh, uh, and, and that spring coil, all that stuff, that would be like the subarachnoid space, okay? Except in, in this situation, right? like in your mattress, uh, it's, it's just air, right, between the springs. But in this case, it's not air. It's filled with uh, fluid. Which we call the cerebrospinal fluids, and so these these spring coils, these uh, structures in this sub arachnoid space, along with the CSF, it provides a little bit of cushioning and support. Okay, so like you know, if I do bump my head, there's a bit of shock absorbance uh, that that's going to be able to um, uh, to 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 occur, right? So you don't directly damage your your brain. Okay, so that's what that's what it is for. Uh, do we have any question about? the um, label here before we go back to our PowerPoints. Okay. And, and again, right, like all these uh, excess uh, CSF, it's gonna drain in this dural venous sinus. And to give you a physical location, right, like that, it's like along this line right here in the middle, right? That's where the dur uh, dura separates uh, to create that, that pocket. Uh, what the CSF stands for, CSF is, Cerebral, spinal, fluid. And again, we'll talk more about it later, okay? It's a fluid that surrounds the, the, the brain, the cerebrum, and the, um, and the spinal cord. Cerebral, spinal fluid, okay? You, you, you make about 600 to 700 milliliters of this stuff uh, per day. More on that later. Any other question? All right, fantastic. Um, so if you need to read more about it, um, you know, please do that at your own time. But that's basically what I told you. Uh, that's a Duramata. We have the arachnoid matter, sub space, 
PMRT array, and we already labeled it. And then this is the actual colored version of what we label. If you if you want to um, go through that yourself, um, that would be a good idea as well. And, and this shows you right the, the coronal session that I told you about. If you separate it, right, and then we're zooming in right here at the top. Right? That's where the dural venous sinus is. That's where we're going to be draining our CSF. That's one location where we can drain it anyway. So there are other locations. Uh, and when I say drain, I mean it drains back to your blood. Okay, the cerebrospinal fluid is going to return to circulation to your blood. But, you know, don't, don't worry about that for now. We will we'll write all that out later on. Like right now. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the, uh, at the CSF. Okay, so the CSF is formed by glial cells. Now, I don't know if you remember glial cells, right? We talk about that... Um, at the very beginning of lecture five, these are supporting cells. Supporting cells of the nervous system. Uh, so far, we've only learned about oligodendrocytes as well as Schwann cells. They are important for forming the myelin right, along the axon. Well, here is an other type of glial cells. They are called ependymo cells. That's how you pronounce them, ependymo cells. The ependymo cells are found in these structures called choroid plexus. Okay. When you see the word choroid, it means it is. Um, vascularize okay it has blood vessels that's what choroid means okay contains blood vessel okay. it's it's vascularize right like like a heavy extensive network of blood vessels um and, and plexus is just kind of like this you know spongy structure so within the choroid plexus you will find these ependymo cells. And the ependymo cells are responsible for creating the cerebrospinal fluid. Now let's take a look at this. Uh, this is a real brain. Okay. The choroid plexus is not real. Okay. They, they just, you know, highlight probably like edit it to show you where it is. Uh, but this is another um, frontal section. You're cutting the brain into front and back, and then you're looking at it like that. Okay, and um, you will if you cut the brain like that, you will you will see two very big uh, hollow cavities. Okay, we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, but you have um, four ventricles in your in your in your brain. Okay? Remember the heart, right? We have two ventricles, two empty chambers, basically. Your brain has four. Okay. So these are the two major ones, and we call them lateral, lateral ventricle. Okay. So lateral ventricle on the um, on the on the left side here, and lateral ventricle on the right side. Again, we're looking at the the brain from the front. That's why the left and the right are are opposite, right, to what you would expect. So this is another lateral ventricle. So you have two lateral ventricles, uh, each of which are embedded within the hemisphere. Okay, so over here, this is the left hemisphere of the brain. And over here, this is the right hemisphere. Okay. Now, I know it's a lot of, you know, words and terms. Uh, please bear with me and let me know if you need me to slow down or clarify anything. I'm just going to put that down here. Okay. Now, pay attention, right? Uh, you don't have to draw this if you don't want to. 
Okay, so over here, up here, there's a groove that divides the two hemisphere. And earlier, when we were talking about the um, uh, dura mater, remember? The dura mater separates into, into, uh, into a space, right? And creates that little pocket right here, right? up here, and the head. So that, that pocket is where the dural venous sinus is. Can you kind of orient yourself? Do you understand where we are in terms of, uh, you know, the location of all these things? Okay, so what are we talking about, right? Like oh, so many terms, what's going on here? Well, within the ventricles, and we have four of them, okay? You only see two here, the lateral ventricles. Within these ventricles, you will find the choroid plexus. They are like these little spongy things with lots of blood vessels in it, and they are stuck to the um, each of the ventricles, okay? So um, if you have four lateral, uh, four ventricles in total, you would expect to have uh, you know, four of these uh, choroid plexus, okay? What are the choroid plexus for? Choroid plexus contains ependymal cells, and the ependymal cells will produce the CSF, okay? cerebral spinal fluid. Let's take a look what we have here. Um, so I'll read this to you first, and then we will label everything and, and, and you know, help you understand the whole thing. So cerebrospinal fluid fills brain ventricles, which totally makes sense, okay? Because if you look at here, if the, if the structure produced um, the, the CSF, and, and, and uh, let me just change the color here. Okay, so the core plexus produced the CSF. The CSF comes out immediately. They're going to fill up the whole ventricle, right? like that, and then over here as well. And then it's going to go, you know, fill up the third ventricle, fourth ventricle, and so on and so forth. And um, um, I'll tell you where this is later, but in the middle of your spinal cord, there is a tiny um, canal that goes all the way down, right, from the base of your neck all the way to the lower back. Um, that canal is called the central canal. That's also filled with CSF. I'll show you where that is later. Uh, it fills the subarachnoid space. You remember where this is, right? I'm just going to write it out for you one more time. This is the space between sandwich, sandwiched between arachnoid, mata, and pia mata. Right? This is where the uh, spider web looking stuff are, right? the spring coil of your mattress, if you like that analogy. That is filled with CSF. Excess CSF is drained into the dural venous sinus, which then returns to the cardiovascular uh, system, okay? So uh, let's do some labeling. We'll come back to the function later. Okay, I, I just need to go through the anatomy portion first and just make sure that you know where we are. So here, this is the next thing we're gonna label, okay? Again, you can you can put it at the bottom if you want, but it's just easier for me to just do it up here, okay? So what 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 have we got uh, in this um, in this uh, place? Okay, so let's let's go through the ventricles first. Right, now, this is not the best diagram for ventricles. Uh, but, you know, bear with me, it, it will make sense afterwards, okay? I'll repeat it so many times that by the end of the, this session, you will probably remember it, okay? Now, if you, cut, if you cut the brain right down the middle, right? We call that a mid-sagittal cut, right? So I should probably write this down for you. This is a mid-sagittal section. You're cutting it right down the middle. Okay. Now listen to me. 
if you cut the brain down in the middle, every time I show you a mid sagittal section of the brain, you will always notice this band here. Okay, this this big white band. Okay, we're gonna label that later on, but let me show you again. You don't have to flip, okay? Just just watch, okay? See, then this is another mid sagittal session, okay? And and you notice this big band in the middle, right? Okay, you will always see that if you see a mid sagittal brain. Okay, let me just show you a couple more, just so you know what I'm talking about. Brain, brain, brain. Where's the brain? Right here, okay? There we go. Okay, I'm show you a real brain, maybe. If this is a real brain, and you see this this thing right here. Okay, never mind what that's called. That's not what we are focusing right now. Okay, what I do want you to focus on is the space beneath that band. Okay, so this is a real brain, right? and you can see quite nice in this picture that there is a big gap here, right? You can actually stick your hand in, okay, and then you will be able to feel around, and, and it's kind of like a C shaped structure um, uh, behind that. Okay, and that is what I want you to, um, to label right now. Sorry, program kind of freezed here. Okay, there we go. Okay. So underneath that band, you will see this structure right here. Okay. And again, like I said, you are going to be able to uh, uh, stick your hand in there and, and you will feel like a, a, a space that's really, really big. Okay, it opens up like that. I'll show you on a model in a bit. Uh, and that here is your. Uh, lateral ventricle. Okay, I'm going to add a label here. Okay, that that is part of. It's not the whole thing, but it's part of the lateral ventricle. And how many of these do you have? Hopefully, in your mind, you're thinking two, right? Okay, two lateral ventricles. Uh, but we are only looking at one of them right here. Okay, this this is the the right half of the brain. Should probably tell you as well. Okay. A lot of people have trouble seeing which half of the brain this is. This is the right half. Right hemisphere. Okay. How do you know it's the right half? Uh, you try to look for this cloud spongy thing. Okay, That is located at the back uh, of the head. And you know if you're looking in the middle of the brain and this is the back, then this has to be the right half. Okay, the right hemisphere. Okay. Now, hopefully, I haven't lose too many of you yet. So there is the spongy stuff that I was talking about. Right, that's one of them. Uh, and then there's another spongy thing here, and then there is another spongy thing here. Okay, so all these things. They are the choroid plexus. Okay, so over here, choroid plexus. Okay. And I know we talk about it already, but let's let's write it out. These are vascularized tissue. That means they have a um, Blood vessels. Okay. That contains ependymo cells. Which makes CSF. Okay. So Sorry, just gonna go back here to show you. Um, right here, right? That's the one that we're looking at right now, the core plexus. Right? So they contain the ependymal cells, which makes the CSF. So here, this is another ventricle that we're gonna label in a bit. That is also a core plexus. Okay, so each ventricle is going to have its own choroid plexus. Uh, 
All right, let's see if we can uh, label more. So you see uh, the core plexus will produce the CSF, which will fill up the lateral ventricle. And then the lateral ventricle will, will, will allow the CSF to flow into the third ventricle, which is right here. Okay. From the third ventricle, it will flow, flow through this duct, and then it will fill up the fourth ventricle. Okay, so let's just label these ventricle first. Lateral goes to the third ventricle, which is what E is. It's okay if you can't visualize this yet. Okay, I'm going to show you a 3D model afterwards, which will make it better. From the third, it will go to the fourth. Okay, so the fourth is kind of like a triangle structure right here. Between this and this, and we'll learn about those names later on. Now there is a hole here. There's a little tiny opening that allows the CSF to go from the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle. Okay. Uh, a hole in the in the body is called a foramen. Foramen. Okay. Uh, F O and then ramen, like the you know cup noodles. Okay. Foramen. It's a hole. This foramen, this hole, connects the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle. So we call it the interventricular foramen. is a hole that connects two ventricles together. Intraventricular, interventricular foramen. From the third, it's going to drain down this narrow duct and it's going to go into the fourth ventricle. That duct right there is called the cerebro. Cerebro, aqueduct. Okay. So each of the ventricles are going to be producing its own CSF, but then they are also kind of flowing uh, forward uh, at the same time. So let's try to visualize what's going on here, okay? Let me find a 3D model to show you, uh, and hopefully it will clear things up, okay? All this is available on eCentennial. Uh, if you want to play around with it. So this is, again, the uh, the right hemisphere uh, of the brain. And, and, you know, they take away all the surface structure so you can see through the brain, right? So this is, this right here, number one, that's the lateral ventricle. You see how big it is, right? Okay, so I said, right, like you, you stick your hand in that little little gap under the, the white band, and then you can feel that it, it's like a C-shaped structure. Okay? And if you look at it from the front, you can see we have the, 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 the right lateral ventricle right here. It's kind of like a horn, right? And then over here, that's the uh, uh, left lateral ventricle. If you look at it from the back, right, you can see, again, the lateral ventricle. They, 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 they kind of like, you know, go to the side and then arches at the front. You see that? Okay, so this whole thing is the lateral ventricle. And inside the lateral ventricle, you will have the choroid plexus. Okay, I can't draw on this thing, but like you would have the spongy thing right here, and it will be producing its own cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, now you see number four right here. Number four, let me click on it. There is the interventricular foramen. It's like a tiny, well, not too tiny when you zoom in like that. But that allows the CSF from, from this portion from this lateral ventricle to drain, to drain into number two here. What's number two? Do you remember what's number two from the labeling? Where does Third it go? Third ventricle? 
That's right. That's the third ventricle. Thank you, Leah. Uh, and, and you can see there's only one third uh, ventricle, right? It's right in the middle. So both sides of the lateral ventricle will drain into the third ventricle, which is located along the midline. Okay? And, and you would have like an interventricular foramen on each side. You can see it right here, right? There, there is one right there. And then there is an other one right here. So each of them will drain and fill out the third ventricle. Okay. Of course, the third ventricle also has its own uh, choroid plexus. Okay. And it's going to be producing its own CSF as well. Okay. At the same time as it is receiving CSF from the lateral ventricle. All right, then from the third ventricle, it is going to go down this narrow, narrow duct, okay, which is number five, and that is called the cerebral aqueduct, cerebral aqueduct. Okay. It's also right along the midline, you can see right here, uh, uh, and then it's going to drain into this triangle-looking thing, which is, of course, the fourth ventricle. Do you guys understand this a little bit better now? With the with the 3D view, uh, you you really have to like click around on your own to to kind of you know have your own mental uh, you know picture of what it looks like and how things goes. But seriously, though, like any question, <laughs> I know I keep I on asking you guys. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, the fourth ventricle is there one on each side or is just one on the right side? Oh yes, excellent question. It's just in the middle. Okay, just there's only one. Yeah, it's uh. You are only seeing half of it, but um, it opens up um, like it's it's like a big structure, like big triangle pyramid structure um, in the middle, midline. OK, so lateral, lateral and then third in the middle, duck in the middle and then fourth in the middle as well. OK, thank you. Yep. Anyone else? OK. Oh, we have a, I have a private uh, message. Let's see. Third ventricle is like the head, and uh, yeah, 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 sure. Oh yeah, yeah. I yeah. Look, it's kind of like one of those mythical monsters that you see in movies, right? Okay, like you have the, <laughs> the third ventricle as a head, and you know maybe that's the eye, and then and then you get the horn going at the top. Okay, like two horns. Okay, uh, and then uh, and then I guess you have the neck here at the number five cerebral aqueduct. And then you have some, I don't know what that is, like a weird body going on. Whatever, whatever helps you, okay? Remember this stuff, uh, whatever helps you visualize it. Okay? But that's, uh, that's a pretty cool analogy. I like that. Okay, uh, now moving down, moving down. We have the, we have the number uh, 13 here. Okay? We learned about 13 before, mind you. Um, just want to throw it out there. Anybody remember what the name of 13 is? This part of the brain, number 13, wild guests, anyone? Spinal cord? Uh, we're not yet out of the head yet, but that's a, a, a good guess. Eventually, we'll transition into the spinal cord. But just before we do that. Brain right stem? Here. Was that Sierra? Say it one more time. I didn't quite catch that. One more time, maybe? No? no that's okay. Um, this is the medulla oblongata, guys. That's, the, uh, that's the, uh, where the respiratory center is, right? Okay, uh, and, and, and then once it exits the skull, it will become the spinal cord. But what I want to point your attention to is um, after the fourth ventricle, it's going to go into this very narrow uh, central canal. And this central canal is going to go all the way down to your lower back. Okay, we're going to come back to that later. So you see medulla oblongata, and then in the middle, we have the central canal, and that's going to be continuous with your spinal cord. Okay, uh, enough said. Let's go back to here and see what else we can label. Um, so the CSF will um, let us continue to color these things. It will um, go down here, okay? And then it will, it will travel through this very narrow duct over here, okay? So, so this portion here is going to be the spinal cord. And at the center of the spinal cord, right there, you can't really see, it's just really narrow. That is the central canal. Central canal. Okay. 
There's just so much information. Like I can't possibly throw everything at you. So just, you know, uh, I'm going to tell you something and that there are some gaps in between and then we'll fill in the gaps as we go. Okay. So like something else happens after it goes down the spinal cord, but eventually they come back up and then it will surround the brain. Okay. It will surround the brain. Okay, like this. So anywhere you see an arrow, you can just color it in with, um, with, uh, with blue to represent the um, CSF, okay? There we go. Okay, so it originates from the inside of the brain, from the ventricles, and eventually surrounds the entire brain as well as the entire uh, spinal cord. Okay, so A here, that, that's just, uh, it's just pointing at the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid. And then we have another cerebrospinal fluid here. All right. It's going to give you a moment to catch up, color, whatever you need. Okay, uh, let's just add more things to it, things that we've already learned um, onto the diagram. So over here, right, you see, it's kind of hard for me to, um, to outline on the computer, but, but there is the dura mater, and it separates. You see, it separates into two layers because we're looking at a mid-sagittal section. That's where the two layers are going to separate, right? Okay, right there. Okay, I'm not going to go all the way around. It's just too hard for me, but you can do that. Um, and so, you know, that's the dura mater. Outermost layer of our meninges. Right there. So if that's the dura mater, what would C be? What is C? As you think about that, maybe I can continue to uh, draw the line. What is C? Tell me out here, please. Tell me I'm not doing a bad job. Tell me the right answer, guys. What is C? Oh, Is it that dural venous sinus? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I also got a private message with the same answer. That is the dural venous sinus. All right. If you don't remember what that is, hold on a second. Let's go back here. You see? The um, dura mater, right? It separates to form that pocket. That pocket allows you to drain the CSF, right? Okay, it looks like a triangle here, but then... If we, if we trace it along the middle of our head, then you can see it, it, it actually is, um, it opens from the front all the way to the back, right? And it's just that the previous diagram, it was a mid-sagittal view. Uh, sorry, the previous diagram was, um, was a frontal view, and this is a mid-sagittal view, right? So that's the dural venous sinus, and that's where you will drain excess CSF back into circulation, back into your blood, okay? While we are at it, let's label a few more things. Okay, so what am I drawing right now? What am I drawing? Pia matter? That is the pia matter, that's right. And it's going to go all around the brain, right? I'm not going to do that, but you could later on. That is the pia mater. Okay. And just one more. Let's see. Let's do green right here. Okay. Right here. Sandwiched between the subarachnoid 
uh, sorry, the arachnoid layer and the uh, and the PM matter, that would be the subarachnoid space. Right, with all the spring coil, right? From the mattress or the spider web looking stuff. Now, the only thing you might be confused at this point <laughs> amongst, you know, 10 other things is that if you look at this diagram, you're like, hey, where is the, where is the arachnoid matter? Okay. I didn't draw the arachnoid matter right, because it's going to be like, uh, it's going to mess up the diagram, right? The arachnoid matter is basically immediately beneath the dura matter. Okay. I, I guess if I really, really have to draw it, uh, it, it will look something like this. Okay, like this pink one is the dura mater, and then right beneath it, like touching to it, like you know, cheese stuck to the toes on a grilled cheese sandwich. That's where you will have your arachnoid mater. Do you guys understand? Okay. Beneath that, you will have your subarachnoid space. Questions? Yeah, the little like the little clouds right where the um, dura matter splits. What is that? Oh yeah, yeah. We didn't talk about the clouds. Yeah, <laughs> the, the little looks like they're little like you know mushroom clouds right right here. I think that that's what you're talking about. Uh, these things, uh, this thing, right? Yeah, and then there's yeah. another mushroom cloud here. Okay, that that's just um, uh, the location where the CSF is actually drained at. Okay, so think think of this as the entire bathtub, and that's like the the little little drain hole uh, for the bathtub. Okay, so they all go right into here, and that's what returns it to the uh, to the circulation. Okay. Okay. What do we call the tiny opening or duct in the dura mater? Which which tiny opening? In the in the dura mater? Oh, you already talk about it. Oh, okay, okay. You, you talk about these things as well, right? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah. They're called subarachnoid uh, granulation, but we don't have to know that. Okay, uh, that's that. You know, I, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, these are things that you, you should uh, do on your own again. Okay, when you print out these sheets from blank, and then um, and then you should label it again uh, to 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 make sense of it. A is CSF, yeah. Uh, thank you for answering, uh, Shana. Yeah, CSF. Okay, so I know it's a lot to uh, take in. Uh, so let's let's just you know do it one more time from a different perspective. Uh, where is this thing? Sorry, it's all over the place. Okay, right here, right here. Use a flow chart. This is page two, I believe. Use a flow chart to show the flow of CSF. Let's do that. Yeah, I, I am confident. I am hopeful. Um, after this picture, everything should like finally, you know, fall in place and and make make good sense. Uh, hopefully, yeah, we'll see. All right. So let's uh let's let's draw a brain again. Right, so this this is the brain, and we're looking at it from the uh, from the front or from the back doesn't really matter. From the front, we can think of. Okay, so there is the brain. Okay, we have a little groove at the top. Okay. Just give me a second here. I'm just gonna show you. So like the, the, the brain, right? If you look at it from the top, it's kind of like a butt cheek, right? You have your two cheeks and then you have the you know little little gap in between. This gap in the in the middle, okay, that separates the uh the, the two halves of the brain. That's this gap that I'm trying to draw right here. Okay. And what's the significance of that gap? Couple of things, okay. Um the ones that we already talked about and that we keep on repeating is you know your dura mater is going to separate and then it's going to form that draining point right up here so we know that already but that's not what we're focusing on right now okay maybe later on okay so we we, we know there is the is the lateral ventricles you should draw this as well okay lateral I'm just gonna call it lv lv lateral ventricle and then we're gonna have the um the third 
and then we're going to have the fourth. It's kind of like a face, right? right? The two halves, the eyes, nose, mouth. And then this one is going to continue to go down. Right? It's going to continue to go down. It's very, very narrow. That is the central canal. Central canal. Which is inside your spinal cord. So your spinal cord is like this. Spinal cord. It's really hard to draw here. Much better on the board. So there's your spinal cord. Okay, now did you know the spinal cord actually um, tapers off, um, you know, kind of like, uh, if you think about your belly button, okay, like, it, but but like on the back, okay? That, that's where the spinal cord will kind of become like this. Okay? It becomes like, you know, a little, little ponytail. Okay? In fact, the name uh, actually means the tail of a horse. Okay? So that's called the uh, calda aquina. Literally means ponytail, horse tail. Okay? More on that later. But basically, this is what happens. This is the, what I'm trying to tell you. The lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, fourth ventricle, they all have their own choroid plexus. In the choroid plexus, there are ependymo cells that mix CSF. So the CSF will drain from the lateral ventricle to the third, from the third, it will drain to the fourth, and then it will go down the central canal. But by the time you get to the Calder Aquina, by the time you get to the ponytail, it's just gonna come out at the bottom, the CSF. The CSF will enter the subarachnoid space and then it will go up. It will surround the head, the brain. Okay, and then the excess one will drain in that little triangle spot that I told you about, right? Which by now you should know, because I've said it like at least six, seven times, the dura venous sinus. So that's kind of like a simplification and an overview of where the CSF comes from and you know where they're going to go and stuff like that. It's not really the best diagram, but you know, hopefully it serves its purposes, purpose. Any question about the diagram before we write it all out in a nice organized flow chart? Okay. So you might wonder, where does the CSF come from? How do we make the CSF? Uh, it turns out CSF is um, derived from blood. Just like, you know, your plasma is, uh, uh, your blood contains a plasma and then your interstitial fluids is derived from that, right? Similarly, the CSF is derived from blood. So the blood is going to go through the vascular tissue, right? The choroid plexus. Okay. And, and, and the ependymal cells will kind of you know, take a certain portion of the blood and make it into your CSF. So the core plexus, you will, uh, again, make the CSF and fill up the lateral, lateral ventricle. And of course you have two of them, right? The horns, <clears throat> each one is embedded within the hemisphere. Don't forget, the core plexus is also found in the third ventricle. So the third ventricle will also be producing its own singular here because you only have one right in the middle. And also the core plexus, you will have another one in the fourth ventricle. That's the triangle looking thing, the pyramid, also one of them right in the middle. 
as the ventricle, as the lateral ventricle is being filled up uh, uh, by the CSF, we're going to drain some into the third. Okay. All the while, number th the third ventricle is producing its own, right? So to go from the lateral ventricles into the third, we have to go through a tiny hole. What do we call a hole in the body? A hole in the body is called a foramen. Okay, foramen. And this one connects the ventricles together, so we call it the interventricular foramen. So each lateral ventricle goes through its own interventricular foramen into the third. From the third, it will go into the fourth. And there is something that connects it, right? What's the name of that? Why don't you think about it and look it up? What connects the third and the fourth? Cerebral aqueduct. That's the one. Thank you. Cerebral aqueduct. I don't know who names these things, like strangest name ever, but that's what it's called. It's a narrow duct that connects the third and the fourth. After the fourth, it's going to go into another, even more narrow um, channel, uh, which is called the central canal. And that starts in the medulla oblongata, your brain stem, right? And then once it exits your skull, it becomes a spinal cord, and that goes all the way down until the spinal cord opens up into the ponytail, the calda aquina, and then the CSF all comes out. Okay. Um, but basically, when I say it all comes out, I don't mean like it leaks all over the place. Okay. I mean it's going to go into the, uh, it's going to uh, travels all the way down. To, to the bottom, and then it's going to fill fills the subarachnoid space. I, I guess I don't have to say fill. We we'll just say subarachnoid space. All right, that's where all the spring coils are, right? The little spider web looking stuff. And ultimately, uh, they will all have to go back to the dural venous sinus. That's the separation of the dur uh, the dura mater, right? And then it's going to go into there and all those little mushroom-looking cloud things, that's where you will drain them specifically. And it will drain it back into the blood. And that's happening like all day long. You make approximately 600 to 700 milliliters of this stuff per day, right? That's a lot. So that's the uh, flow of CSF. I haven't tell you what it does yet, by the way. Okay, I just tell you how it's being produced and how it circulates and where where it goes uh, in the in the um, in the CNS. Any uh, final questions before we take a break? Excellent. All right, let's take five and we will do more when we come back. See you in a bit. Okay, let's keep going. Back to the PowerPoint. Um, so now that we have a detailed explanation of where the CSF came from, where they go and where they drank and so on and so forth. Let's talk about the function, right? What do we need them for? Why do we need like 600 to 700 milliliters of this stuff every day? Uh, well, one function of CSF is to um, basically create a protective layer around your central nervous system, particularly important in the brain. So uh, it cushions the CNS uh, so that it's not going to be, you know, sloshing around and hitting the bony structure that protects them. Uh, and it essentially creates buoyancy to allow the brain to flow inside the skull. 
um, and to prevent concussion. Because if you move your head to the front, which way does your brain actually move? Think about it. If uh, let me see if I can draw this. If you move your head to the front suddenly, okay, which way does the head uh, does the brain move? Yeah, exactly. It moves to the back, right? It's it's uh, it's just like when you're in the car. If 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 uh, the car if the driver slams on the brake, right, you're gonna have a tendency to go forward. And if the driver accelerates really suddenly, then you have tendency to go backwards, right? So your your brain is kind of like that, right? This this is called inertia. It's physics, right? So if 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 the if the head goes forward really quickly, the brain's gonna go to the back, and and if the force is so great, it's possible for the brain to to smash into the side of the skull, uh, and it will hurt the brain. Right? So we we prevent that by having. The CSF it creates a, a, a physical barrier, a, a, um, like a cushioning barrier that prevents this from happening all the time. But if the force is strong enough, um, it will it will happen, and and that's basically what a concussion is. Um, for you know a pro athlete, that happens. You know when they play football, hockey, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, and and even for like uh, just ordinary people who don't play professional sports or if, if you if you bump your head really really hard it's possible um, to create a concussion but you know basically generally speaking the CSF prevents that from happening all the time like if you shake your head back and forth right it's not going to be rattling inside your head the brain uh, and and you know causing bruise all the time because of the CSF now the CSF uh, composition like in terms of what is in the CSF, um, it's tightly regulated by what's called a blood-brain barrier, the BBB. And the BBB is formed by another kind of um, glial cells called the astrocytes. Okay? Now, it's not... Uh, it, it, some, some people, they, they, they hear the word barrier and then they automatically think of like a, a physical structure that you can take out and then and then you know kind of hang up and say oh look this is a this is this is the barrier okay it's not showing up <laughs> but but it's not really like a film uh, of, of membrane that you can hold up it's, it's more like this uh, it would make more sense if i draw it um for you okay so so uh this this is a blood vessel okay and then you will have let's say this is this is the neuron or something okay this is the neuron neuron Okay, neurons, and then you, you have a bunch of neurons here and there, okay? Uh, and so the, the blood is where you're supposed to create the CSF uh, from, right? Okay, and so what happens is you will have these special cells called the astrocytes, right here, astrocytes. They kind of look like neuron, astrocyte. You don't have to draw this, you can just watch. And these astrocytes, they have long uh, legs, if you would, they're not axons okay, because they're not neurons, right? They don't communicate or anything. Uh, and, and at the end of these, uh, you know, legs, they would have a, like a suction cup that goes onto the blood vessels. Okay? And then you might have another suction cup here. Okay, like that. And then you will have another astrocyte here. And then that would have another suction cup. Okay, and then maybe you will have another one here. And then there's another suction cup. And eventually, you're just going to have the entire uh, blood vessels being sealed by all these, you know, suction cups, I keep on calling them, from the astrocytes. Okay? And, and that is what the blood-brain barrier is, a barrier that is formed by the astrocyte, and the barrier is separating the blood vessels from the brain tissue. Okay, So this is the BBB. And, and again, it's not like a physical membrane that you can separate. They're they are just like a microscopic barrier. And, and of course, it looks much better uh, when you look at the, uh, the diagram right here, right? Okay, that, that's basically what it is. The astrocyte will seal off the, um, the blood vessels. Uh, and in some cases, it also seals off the neuron. So it creates a barrier. And this barrier regulates what's, what, what can go into the brain and what should be kept out of the brain. So things like, you know, water, nutrients, lipid soluble molecules, they can cross um, quite easily. Some things like glucose and amino acid, these are crucial nutrients. They would have to go through, um, you know, some active transport. 
last time uh, in lecture five, we talked about um, Parkinson disease, right? And I said uh, is not uh, it's it's not useful for for uh, people with Parkinson to take dopamine because the dopamine is not going to be able to cross the blood brain barrier. So that's the BBB that I'm talking about. Okay, so that's why they created the left dopa, right? Which is designed to be lipid soluble and it's going to be able to cross the BBB. Um, and, and then your, your neurons are going to use it as a, as, a, as a starting material, as a raw material to make more dopamine. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the uh, astrocytes and the BBB. So by now we've learned four types of glial cells, um, which again, just to reiterate, we have the oligodendrocytes that makes myelin in the CNS. We have the Schwann cells that makes myelin in the PNS. Uh, earlier uh, this morning, we talked about the ependymal cells, which are found in the choroid plexus, and they make the CSF. And now we have the astrocytes, which um, is responsible for forming the blood brain barrier. Uh, and it screens the contents uh, of the CSF and make sure that you know things are not supposed to go into the brain, doesn't go through. But this is not a perfect barrier. Um, you know, some toxins do go through, right? Um, and things like mercury, they're able to go through. So it's not, not a perfect barrier. In any case, this is just another uh, diagram that shows you the ventricles, right? And from, by now, you should be familiar with the horn-shaped structure. That will be the lateral ventricles. Goes into the third, which is right in the middle, okay? It looks like this if you look at it from the side. Kind of with the eye, I'll tell you what that eye is later on. Uh, and uh, to 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 go from the lateral to the third, you go through the interventricular foramen, into the third, and then to the fourth, through the cerebral aqueduct, and then finally down the central canal. Right. So that's that's what we have been uh, learning all morning. This is the real thing, uh, a real brain. And and like I said, right, you see all these like. Uh, bay, beige ish color, brownish color, right? That, that's, that's what the actual thing uh, uh, look like, right? Um, and, and this is the band that I keep on telling you about. Right? And, and there is a gap underneath the band. Uh, and again, if you just stick your hand in there, you'll be able to feel the C shape uh, structure of the, um, uh, what did I say, of the lateral ventricle. Okay, so that's what LV is. This is the third, and this is the fourth. Right? The fourth is the uh, little triangle that I keep on talking about. The third is just an oval right, with the eye in the middle, remember? And then, and then the horn structure. Uh, in anatomy, usually, not usually, but like a lot of times there are, are two different names for the same thing. So when they say like FM here, we're not going to worry about that, okay? That that's basically the uh, intraventricular foramen that we were talking about, and then instead of SA, we uh, call it cerebral aqueduct, right? That's the other one, okay? Right here. Uh, those like FM and and SA, it, it's a name that give credit to the person who named them, okay? Uh, we're just going to stick with what we call it, okay? That's it. So nothing new so far after the break, same old, same old. What happens if you block the CSF uh, drainage or if you block the um, flow of CSF? I mean, look at this, look at this duct, right? This cerebral aqueduct, it's so tiny. Like if there is some kind of a thing that blocks it, like maybe a, a tumor of some sort, then there's no way for the CSF to go from the third to the fourth, right? And then it just kind of builds up. Right. So, you know, CSF can be blocked for various reasons. And in general, if that happens, uh, we have a condition called hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus. Right. So the buildup of water, right? Hydro, but we know it's not water, it's a CSF, right? Inside our brain. That's basically what it is. And in an infant, the ventricles can enlarge uh, because of the CSF buildup. Um, you might have heard of babies that are born with like really big heads, right? Uh, that is usually a sign of hydrocephalus. The difference between like baby's head and our head, the skull uh, specifically, is that 
Um, the baby skull is very uh, soft, right? If you ever look at the head of the baby, the top of the head of the baby, you can see it pulsating, right? That's not really the brain, but you know, it's the blood vessels uh, uh, underneath the skin and, and that's still pulsating, the soft spot we caught, right? Okay. And, and the skull is still pretty, um, pretty, pretty soft at that point. So when, when, when you have all these extra CSF building up in the, in the infant because of hydrocephalus, it pushes out and it causes the, the skull to be you know, a little bit bigger. In adults, however, uh, our, our skull is fully ossified, full, fully calcified. It's hard. It's not flexible. Uh, and so all that pressure that builds up uh, uh, is just going to be building up internally with no way of, of relieving the, the, the pressure. And, and so if you take a look at the ventricles, the lateral ventricle, right, it's much bigger compared to normal over here, right? So all these tissues that are around the lateral ventricles are being, being compressed by the excess pressure. Okay, so uh, it's a dangerous situation and it needs to be resolved. Uh, the, the source of the block needs to be identified. And um, sometimes they put in what's called a shunt, S-H-U-N-T. Uh, and, and, and a shunt is basically like a, like a redirection of these uh, CSF to drain either outside of the body or drain in the uh, abdominal cavity, okay? But um, that's, that's just relieving the, the pressure buildup. You still have to identify the source of the blockage and, um, you know, and, 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 and remove it um, to, to, to allow the flow to, uh, to be restored to normal, okay? So that's hydrocephalus. We talk about meningitis, right, which is the inflammation of the meninges. Um, generally, it can be caused by bacteria or virus. You can have bacterial meningitis or viral meningitis. It's also possible to have fungus uh, to cause that as well, although that is uh, quite uh, rare. Um, and so um, it's a higher risk for high school students and, and college students. Uh, apparently, it has to do with the lifestyle, uh, you know, living in dorm, that kind of stuff kind of increase the risk of uh, uh, catching meningitis. Uh, the Ontario vaccination um, schedule does include uh, a standard meningitis uh, vaccine, um, but there are different forms of meningitis right, that are caused by different bacteria and different viruses. So um, to get the full protection, you actually had to if you wish, you can get more vaccines that are not covered by OHIP, uh, and uh, and you know it's recommended for, for 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 students in high school and college to to actually get that uh, to get the protection. The symptoms include headaches, fever, and uh, stiff neck, um, and severe form can lead to paralysis, coma, as well as death. Um, to diagnose, the person would um, either do like an x-ray or a CT scan and sometimes a spinal tap. Okay, so what a spinal tap is, um, they take a little sample of your cerebrospinal fluid and then they would go culture it. Right? So the person is, uh, is going to lie on the bed. They will take out a little bit of like um, freezing agent, they spray it onto the skin to kind of numb the skin. And then they would stick a needle uh, inside your, uh, at the back here and extract a little bit of CSF. Okay. Uh, and it goes in between what we call like an L3 and L5. You have five bones here in the lumbar section. We'll learn that, uh, later on L1 to L5 and between L3 and L4, they're going to stick the needle in. They're going to get the CSF out and then they're going to culture it. Now you, uh, if you have kids, um, if you have given birth before, um, you would know that's also the same location of where they inject the uh, epidural, okay, which is uh, something that would, um, you know, uh, basically take away the pain uh, uh, during labor. Uh, uh, and they also deliver the drug um, in the same location. Now, you might wonder, hey, isn't it dangerous to, you know, stick a needle into your spinal cord? Like, what, what if you poke through your spinal cord? Isn't that a big problem? Well, uh, it's not too bad because um, at the bottom of the spinal cord, I told you, it becomes like a ponytail, right? It kind of fans out. So when you do stick the needle in, like it, it's it's like poking a needle through your hair, right? Like your hair is just going to move out of the way, right? It's 
it's impossible for the needle to to go through a hair, right? Like you can you can put a needle through your head and, and it will never go through a hair. So similarly, when you put the needle in uh, to either deliver the epidural or to take a sample of the CSF, your spinal cord at that location, they would just move away and, and, and you will be able to take the fluid without damaging the spinal cord, okay? Uh, of course, complication can happen and uh, sometimes, um, you know, it could lead to undesirable outcome. We actually know uh, 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 someone who who had like a uh, like a coworker um, who who had this procedure done, and uh, and what happens is uh, afterwards uh, the CSF was leaking from uh, from uh, from the insertion site. Okay, uh, and then she was feeling dizzy and all that uh, following the procedure, uh, and you know they actually have to went back to the hospital uh, the next day to uh, to get it looked at. So you know sometimes there are these undesirable outcome, uh, but generally it is a um, relatively uh, safe procedure to diagnose something that is, um, you know, could have a very, very, very bad outcome. Okay, so that's a uh, meningitis and spinal tap. Okay, uh, sorry, I've been talking like for the whole day without, you know, giving you guys any uh, poll questions. Let's do some now. Go for it. Uh, thank you for participating. The answer is B, between the two layers of dura mater, right? It separates and form that little gap along the middle. That's where you will drain your CSF. How about this one? Uh, good, that's the ependymal cells in the choroid plexus. That's what's formed the CSF. Astrocytes forms the BBB. These forms the um, myelin. Let's do another one. Yeah, pretty good. Okay, I mean, <laughs> I've been repeating it all morning. So by now, you probably are sick of uh, me talking about it. The correct answer is the uh, cerebral aqueduct. Very good. Okay, that's it for the polls for now. Now let's uh, move on to the nervous system. Okay, so like I said, the sorry, move on to the spinal cord. So uh, let me get myself out of the way. The spinal cord here right, comes down from the... Um, from the medulla oblongata, which transitions into the spinal cord as it exits the, um, the brain. And uh, we have different sections of the spinal cord, depending on the section of the backbone that it comes out, uh, that, that it associates with. So cervical C1 to uh, uh, C7, that's like the neck region. And then you have the thoracic, which is kind of in the chest area and then the lumbar, L1 to L5. And, you know, between the three and four, right, that's where you do the spinal tap I was telling you about. And then it becomes the horsetail um, uh, pretty high up, right? Like I said, it's, it, it's around 
around where your belly button is, right? If your belly button was at the back, that, that's where it will fan out and become these uh, horse tails. Um, I mean, there is a reason why that happens, but um, you know, it, it's, it's beyond the scope of, uh, of our course. So we are not gonna uh, talk about it. Okay, uh, spinal cord. This is a transverse section of the spinal cord. Uh, this is not the natural color of the spinal cord. It has been stained. And um, if you look at transverse section of the spinal cord, you will always see a butterfly shape in the middle. Okay, And uh, if you see the butterfly, um, you would notice that the butterfly is upside down. Right? Uh, with the top of the wings here and then the bottom there. And so the top of the butterfly corresponds to the front of the body. Okay, so this, this over here, that's the anterior portion to the front of the body. And then this would be the back, the um, posterior. Okay. Except uh, when we use, uh, when, we, when we talk about the, um, the spinal cord, sometimes we, we, we use these words instead, <clears throat> dorsal, which is another word for posterior. And then the front uh, is, uh, is ventral, which is another word for anterior. Okay. Sometimes we use dorsal and ventral instead of um, you know, anterior posterior. So the butterfly, is the butterfly white or gray? Hmm? White matter or gray matter, the butterfly? Gray? That's right, the gray matter is in the middle for the spinal cord. That's where the thinking occurs. And then on the outside, that's where you will have the white matter. We're gonna go and label this together. Um, hopefully it will make more sense. Where is the spinal cord? We just have to find it. There we go. Okay. So this is a transverse section, right? This is a transverse section. of your spinal cord. All right, so we're gonna try to put everything together. Things that we've learned last um, class and then we're gonna combine it with, with what we learned you know, today. Remember we drew this um, diagram last week with the, uh, let me see if I can find it, with, um, you know, touching the uh, candle and then, I said the Averin pathway is going to send the signal to the CNS. You have interneurons to process it. And then uh, you're going to have the Efferin pathway that comes back out, right? So let's see what this looks like in, uh, in terms of, in relation to the spinal cord, okay? So you touch that hot thing, whatever it is, candle, hot stove, and then we're going to have a sensory neuron that, that comes in going to enter the, it's going to have the cell body right here, actually. And then it's going to continue to go and enters the spinal cord at the back. So this blue thing that I just uh, drew, this is the sensory neuron. Which again, contains sensory information, whatever it might be. Right? Temperature, pressure, pain, light. Right, sound, whatever senses we're talking about, it's going to get um, passed on to your central nervous system. Okay, so sensory information is going to go this way into your spinal cord. And sensory information generally enters at the back of your spinal cord. Okay. So um, you see the butterfly, right? Gray matter, I'm gonna color it gray. But again, it's not actually gray, right? I keep on emphasizing that. Oh, by the way, like just, just so you know, right? 
uh, as a com- as a comparison to like things that we 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 see every day. How how big do you think your spinal cord is? How big do you think your spinal cord is? You know, let's um uh, let's uh let's let's do some polls, okay? Do you think your spinal cord is uh as thick as like you know a highlighter like this highlighter? Okay, as thick as a pencil. Okay, or as thick as like a, you know, like a candle, like a standard size candle. And candle is bigger than the uh, the highlighter, right? Okay, what what do you think? Let's do a poll and and, and see. Uh, you know what your perception is on this. Cool. Uh, yeah, uh, most people say it's pencil. Yeah, some say highlighter. No, a good, good thing. Oh, that's not how you spell candle. Sorry. <laughs> candle. I was thinking about the central candle. Candle. Uh, so it, it's good thing none of you think it's it's a candle. It's a scary thing. You have a gigantic candle going up your down down your back. Uh, but it's not as big as a highlighter either. Okay, it's it's just about the size of a of a standard pencil. Okay, that's how how um, big your spinal cord is. Not too thick actually. Okay, uh, and it's tucked nicely in your um, in your backbone. Okay, so in the middle of it, that's that's where the gray matter is. Maybe we should label that. Um, over here, that is the gray matter. And on the outside, uh, that's where you will have the white matter. And I'm going to add a tiny circle right there in the middle. So tiny right there. What is that, huh? What is that tiny circle that I just added? Tell me, please. What is that? The what, Shelly? Sorry? The foramen. Oh, the foramen is all the way up in the brain, right? Okay. This one is something else. Good try, though. Okay. Anybody remember what that is? The central canal. That's right. Remember, you have your spinal cord here, and in the middle, you would have the central canal that goes all the way down, right? That's where the CSF is going to go down, remember? So that's right here, central canal. Very good. Now, this is the front, the, the anterior, the ventral side. And this is the back. I'm not going to put the back there because I need to draw something later on. I don't want it to get in the way, but you know that's the back. Okay. So what's going on here? Well, the sensory neuron will transmit the sensory information, takes it to the central nervous system. In this case, the part of the central nervous system is the spinal cord. And within the gray matter, that's where the thinking occurs, right? You will have this green guy, okay? Which is only found inside the CSF, right? That is the interneuron. Just gonna put it on the side here, interneuron, which will process the sensory information and decide what to do with it. Right. Do we need to move something? Do we need to stay put? Do we need to, you know, increase the heart rate or whatever? It makes a decision. And then it's going to send that decision out uh, using the motor neuron. Okay, so the motor neuron is going to go back out at the front. And then it's going to join this one right here. So the signal is going to go back out, right? This is the motor neuron. Okay, so that, that's the circuitry, circuitry that we talked about last time in lecture um, five, right, with the candle thing. So this probably can go back to the hand if we are talking about touching a hot surface and then you gotta remove the hand. Right? 
So these two things, the sensory neuron and the motor neuron, they actually will be bundled together like that. And that forms a spinal nerve. Spinal nerve. And you might remember there are 31 pairs of these spinal nerves. Okay. We will come back to this uh, diagram in a bit. I just want to show you what this looks like. Uh, I guess we don't need the ventricle anymore. Let me delete that. Uh, we need a spinal cord somewhere. Give me a second. There we go. So this this is a more accurate representation of the uh, color, right? We, we we have the gray matter in the middle, which is kind of brown actually, and then the white matter on the side is, uh, you know, not really white either, lighter color. Okay, so that's the butterfly, and uh, that's the front of the body. That's the back of the body, and and you can see the spinal nerve coming in, right? Actually separates into the sensory going in at the at the dorsal horn at the back, interneuron is going to be within, and then the motor nerve is going to come out from the front, and then they merge together, right, to form your spinal nerve. And uh, uh, the spinal nerve will come out on the side of your backbone. This is one of your backbone. Your backbone has many stacks of these similar. Um, vertebrate that's what it's called okay, and one on top of the other and on the side there's a hole that allows the uh, the spinal nerves to come out okay so you can't really see it in this particular diagram but the, but then you will have a spinal nerve coming out this way and then you have a spinal nerve coming out in the other way um, and this is a bone uh, in your entire backbone okay so on the inside that's where you have your pencil size spinal cord you can see that the there's this grayish film that goes around the spinal cord. If you click on that, you can see that is the dura mater. Okay, and of course, beneath the dura mater, you would have the other two layers, right? The arachnoid as well as the pia mater. Okay, so that's the uh, organization of the spinal cord. little bit more. We, we, we touch the hot surface and then you let go of the hand. That whole thing involves just the sensory neuron going in uh, to the spinal cord, into neuron, deciding that you should re remove your hand and then actually removing the hand. So that happens really quickly. Your brain was not involved in that process. Now, what are some of the things that you do after you actually burn your hand? Well, uh, you might decide to run it under cold water, right? You might decide to, you know, put it on your earlobes. You might decide to, you know, blow onto it to make it feel better. You might rub on it. All these extra things that you do afterwards, that's not the initial reflex. All these extra things that you do involves your brain, okay? So what actually happens there? Well, the sensory information enter, enters the spinal cord uh, and part of it is going to continue through this reflex circuit. But what happens is the signal actually gets split over here and it's going to go up, go up. Okay. And, and, and it's going to go up and then they might make some connection along the way and it will eventually cross the middle and go on to the other side. It's going to keep on going up and then it will go to the brain. So this is called the ascending track. Ascending track, which takes sensory information up and uh, takes sensory information up the spinal cord. Okay, so a nerve and a track they are the same thing, right? Remember, nerve is a bundle of axon outside of the um, CNS, and then track is a bundle of axon within the CNS. Okay, so in this case, the ascending track is located generally at the back 
of the spinal cord. Okay, so information goes up to the brain near the back end of the spinal cord and eventually is going to cross the middle. Okay, so this is the midline, midline. Uh, and, and most of the information, okay, most track, 90% of tracks cross the midline at the medulla oblongata. Okay, you might have heard people say the right half of your brain controls the left half of the body and vice versa. Uh, and, and that's part mostly true okay, because 90% of track crosses the midline. Okay, so it's actually go up to your brain. And we will talk about which part of the brain probably later today or next time. And then your brain is going to decide to do something, right? Okay, run it under cold water, put some ice on, whatever you decided to do, that information is going to come back down from the brain. It's going to also cross the midline. And then it's going to go down your spinal cord. But this time it's going to be going down from the front. And that is going to be the descending track. So basically, sensory information goes up to the brain through the ascending track at the back. And then motor information, instructions, comes down from the brain through the descending tracks that are located at the front of the spinal cord. What about the sides, you ask? Well, the side is kind of mixed, okay? There are some going up and some that are coming down. Um, so we're not going to worry about that for now. Okay, but all these tracks, they are myelinated, and that's what forms the white matter. Any question about this diagram? So again, the initial right, removal of the hand, that only involves the spinal cord, and that's just this part right here, this circuitry. Everything else that you do afterwards, okay, that involves going up to the brain and then coming back down. Okay, so a cross section of the spinal cord shows a white matter uh, forms the outer periphery of the spinal cord while gray matter resides in the center of the spinal cord. Portion of the sensory neuron, okay, so we drew this already, right? Let's just draw it one more time. Sensory neuron comes in and then it has to enter the gray matter because it needs to form a synaptic connection, right? Oh my goodness. It forms the synaptic connection with the interneuron. Okay, so that's what it means by portion of the sensory neuron are found in the gray matter, just a little bit of it. The entire interneuron is going to be inside the gray matter. And then you will also have a portion of the motor neuron. That is going to be found within the gray matter. Again, just to make the synaptic connection with your um, interneuron, right? The white matter of the spinal cord contains ascending tracks, which contains sensory information. It's going to go up to the brain, okay? Cross the midline. As it goes up at the medulla oblongata, continues to go up. It's going to hit a few other spots that we haven't talked about yet. We're going to add more details to it later on. And then we have the descending track, which takes motor information from the brain, generally located at the front, okay, which is not shown in this diagram, right? But you know it's going to be at the front. So if, if you damage the back of the spinal cord, then you might not be able to feel certain part of the body because the ascending track is damaged, right? You can't, you can't have sensation from those parts of the body. If you damage the front of the spinal cord, then uh, maybe you won't be able to move those parts of the body. You can still feel it, 
you feel pain, temperature, so on and so forth, but you won't be able to control it. Okay. If you take a, take a look at a slice of spinal cord, if I show you a, a transverse section of the spinal cord and I ask you, hey, where is this from? Is this from like a higher up section, like a cervical section? That's what the C stands for. Or is it from like a thoracic section or a lumbar or a sacral section? Where is it from? Well, generally speaking, the higher up you are, the more white matter you have, the higher percentage of white matter you have. As you go down the spinal cord, right, you will lose a lot of the white matter because the white matters are made up of ascending tracts and descending tracts, right? So if you think about like a, like a person here, let me try to draw that one more time. Think about like a, a person, right? Okay. So uh, from the legs, you would have spinal, you would have ascending tract going up to the brain. Okay. From the uh, middle part of the body, you would have a sandwich track going up as well. And then from the uh, hands and the chest and all that, you will have a sandwich track going up, going up, going up, right? Eventually, all of it is going to go up to the brain. So basically, all this stuff are white matter. Okay? And as you go down, the, uh, all these uh, uh, tracks are going to exit. Some are going to exit to the hands. Some are going to exit to the abdomen. Some are going to exit to the leg. So by the time you get down to the to the to the to the uh, lumbar section or the, or the sacral section, most of the uh, spinal nerves would have exit already. So you would have very little white matter left. Let me try that one more time. That was uh, probably not the best explanation. Let me try to draw it out again for you. Okay, so let's just think of the the uh, the body like this. Instead of drawing the actual person, let's draw the neck. Okay, hand, not hand, like um, arm, right? Arm, and then trunk. Trunk is like you know the this torso area, right? Torso, we just call it torso. Uh, and then pelvic area, and then maybe the leg, okay? I'm going to draw the ascending track and see. Okay, so the, the leg, we're going to, you know, you burn your leg or something, okay? It's going to send the information up to the brain. Pelvis, right? That will be able to send information up to the brain. Torso, send information up the brain. Arms, send information up the brain. Neck, send information up the brain. Similarly, you're going to have these um, descending tracks that are coming down, right? So you can move your ne neck, you can move your arm, you can move your torso, you can move your pelvic, you can move your legs, right? Okay, so all these things, they are like ascending track and descending track, and all of them forms the white matter, right? So look at all the fibers near the top. You have so much of it because it's coming from all over the body. If you take a look at the spinal cord that are lower down in the body, white matter, white matter. There's not much white matter left, right? Because most of it has been exit or hasn't joined in yet, right? So that's why if you take a look at a slice of your spinal cord that are closer to the top, there will be a higher percentage of white matter compared to a section that is lower down in the spinal cord. Does that make any sense? Okay, so higher percentage, higher percentage of white matter near the top. So I'll show you a slice like that with lots of white matter and ask you, where is it from? You can tell me it's from cervical, C, closer to the top. Okay, the order is like C, T, L, and S. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. Okay, I'll show you a slice with very little white matter going to be in the sacral region.
All right, reflexes. What are reflexes? Reflexes are automatic response to stimulation that occurs without conscious thought or learning. These are not things that you have to learn. The moment you're born into this world, you have certain reflexes that are hardwired, built in uh, uh, in your nervous system. Okay, nobody needs to teach you that. Your body just does it automatically. Uh, and there are two kinds of reflexes: those that involves the brain, such as you know salivation. When you when you're hungry and you smell food or see food, you salivate. Okay. That's a cranial reflex. It involves the brain. Sneezing, okay? that involves the brain. Uh, swallowing, okay? nobody teaches a baby how to swallow. It just automatically knows how to do that. Okay, that's a, that's a reflex. Excuse me, that involves the brain. There are other reflexes called spinal reflexes, and that only involves the spinal cord. Okay, so the knee jerk reflex is probably uh, one that people are familiar with. Like, you know, um, the, you see this in cartoons sometimes, right? Like the, the doctor hit the, the knee and then the, 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 the leg kicks forward a little bit, right? That's the knee jerk reflex. Um, a pin prick reflex, right? If something sharp touch your finger, you automatically remove your hand. That's a spinal reflex, okay? Uh, so here is a knee jerk reflex. It's not really hitting the knee. Right? Your knee is your it's your patella. It's a, it's a kneecap, right? You don't you don't hit hit the kneecap. There is a little tendon um, that is below the kneecap, so that's where you should supposed to tap. And the person has to completely relax their their leg. Okay, so you tap on that. Uh, a signal goes to the spinal cord. The um, uh, there is a little bit of a interneuron here, and then the reflex come out. Uh, and, and cause your leg to go forward. It looks very complicated in this diagram because in order for your leg to kick forward, you need to send excitatory signal to your quadricep, the muscle that will pull your leg forward. But at the same time, you need to send inhibitory signal to your hamstring to tell it to relax, okay? When the quadricep contracts, the hamstring must relax um, in order for the leg to go forward, right? So that's a spinal reflex. Now, um, some reflex uh, will disappear as you grow up. Some will persist throughout the, the course of your life. Okay, Swallowing reflex. You will be able to do it as a baby and you will be able to do it as an adult. Okay? Uh, if, 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 if you walk up to a baby and then you try to put your hand towards the face of the baby, the baby will blink. Okay. And, and that would happen to you as well, right? Like if, if, if I randomly walk up to you and then try to put my hand toward your face, you would move back and blink, right? That's, that's a reflex that is built in and you will keep it throughout life, okay? Some reflexes you will lose. For example, if you, um, if you put your finger into a baby's hand, do you know what will happen? You guess a baby around your house, maybe? Some cousins, some kids, sons, daughters. What happens if you put the finger in the baby's palm? What happens, huh? Yeah, they, they close the hand, right? They would, they would grab onto it, right? They don't know why they're grabbing it, okay? It's a reflex. Put it into their hand, they grab it, okay? And then what happens if I, if I put a finger in, into your hand? Right? Probably going to lose my job for doing that. But <laughs> if I put a hand in, in, in someone's hand, they're like, what are you doing? Like, you're not going to close the hand, right? You lose that reflex, okay, as you grow up. Some reflexes tends to go away, right? And one reflex that goes away is called the Babinski reflex. Okay, Babinski reflex. Um, again, if you have babies lying around in your home <laughs> or if you have access to babies, uh, one of the fun things you can do with it is to take a blunt object, like the back of a, of a pencil or something like that, and then you stroke the bottom of the feet, okay, like this in the, in the diagram. Okay? Uh, and then you will see the, the, the cute little feet, the toes kind of fan out in this pattern. Okay? So that's a normal thing to observe in a, in a baby, okay? Or even in, 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 you know, infant and toddlers up to two years old, okay? That's called a Babinski reflex. If this uh, shows up in adults though, that's not a good sign, okay? Uh, this is often a sign of some kind of uh, uh, problem 
within the, the spinal cord, okay, within the CSF. Okay? The Babinski reflex should go away after two years of age. Okay? And if this happens in the adult, that's uh, uh, usually a sign that something is wrong. So it's a test that doctors sometimes do to determine if there's spinal damage, right? Uh, and again, this is called a Babinski reflex. And it's an example of a spinal reflex that goes away after two years of age. Yeah, so there are a bunch of these reflexes that are not supposed to show up in adults. Uh, and, um, and then there are a bunch of reflexes that are supposed to be there. And if, 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 you, if you are missing a reflex that you're supposed to have, or if you have a reflex that you're not supposed to have, that usually tells the doctor something about um, you know, your CNS. Okay, uh, just some quick questions here. Go ahead. Right, that's a very simple question. It's just uh, sensory information, that's the correct answer. Uh, oh, this one is uh, heavy, lots of reading. I'll let you do that. Hey, uh, some of you are probably still reading. That's okay. I'll, I'll take it up though. Gray matter is found on the uh, the butterfly, right? The center. Okay, so that's not correct. Center. Ascending tracts are generally located at the posterior side, at the back. Motor neuron emerges at the uh, front, at the anterior side. Y matter forms the butterfly. That would be the gray matter. Uh, the gray matter contains interneuron as well as portions of the sensory and motor neuron. That's the correct one. Okay, in fact, we drew a couple times already, right? So that is the true statement. That's it for the spinal cord. Um, let me see what's going on with the brain. Let me think if... Um, we should go on or not. Um, yeah, yeah, I think maybe maybe we could uh, maybe we could just label uh, a brain, and then we will uh, we'll come back to it uh, next class to to go into more details. Okay. So let's see which brain should we do. Uh, yeah, let's do this one. Yeah, this is a nice brain. We will uh, just label the obvious stuff first, and then uh, we'll talk more about it later. All right. So uh, this is the surface of the brain, and there are a lot of grooves and bumps on the brain, and it's kind of unique for everybody. Different people have different patterns in the brain depending on how their brain is wired. Um, generally speaking, uh, a groove, a groove is called a sulcus. Okay. Uh, plural for sulcus is sulci. 
you know, just like nucleus and nuclei. When we have US, we change it to I. Uh, a bum is called a gyrus. And the plural for gyrus is, you guessed it, gyri. There's a lot of grooves and bums. And remember, the pia mater is going to follow all these grooves and, and, uh, and bumps, you know, all these um, contours of the brain. Even though everybody is, uh, okay, I just have a question. No, this, to, to this lecture is not on Wednesday's quiz, okay? Wednesday's quiz is just whatever we did before the engagement week, just lecture five. Even though everybody has different sulcus, sulci, and gyri, um, there are some definitive ones that are always going to be there for everybody's brain. So there is one big one right here. Okay, this one is called the central. Sulcus. Everybody has that. In terms of where it is, well, you know, like if, if you imagine wearing a hair, um, uh, like a hairband, or like I'm wearing like a headphone, right? The the headphone that goes around your head, that that's kind of where the location of the central sulcus is going to be. Okay. Oh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I just got a message. Someone caught a mistake. It's uh, it's actually E that's pointing at the groove. I'm sorry. F is pointing at this uh, patch of brain right here. The central sulcus is this, is this line right here. Thank you. There we go. So that's this line right here, central sulcus. And, you know, what does it do? Well, the central sulcus uh, separates... separates the frontal and parietal lobe. And we're gonna get to those in a second. So this is the frontal lobe. The biggest lobe of the brain right here. All right, so that is the frontal lobe. Uh, I think that's C right here. We're gonna talk more about this next class, okay? But you know, just put some keywords here to help you. Just you know, start getting used to it. Right. Frontal lobe is responsible for higher order thinking. I don't, like, what does it mean? Well, like all the complicated stuff that humans think about, right? Okay. Uh, you know, math, language, uh, abstract stuff, right? what is considered as abstract, like uh, time, the concept of time is abstract, right? Okay. So you, can, you can physically point to something and call it time. It's, it's like an abstract concept, right? Um, things like um, uh, 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 judging reward and risk consequences, all these higher order thinking that happens in the, uh, in the frontal lobe. Okay. Things like personality, Okay, speech, voluntary movement, all that stuff happens in the frontal lobe. Like, you don't have to memorize it now, now. Once we've gone through the lecture, you'll be hearing it so many times from me that you will remember it by then.
And then we have the parietal lobe here. Right here. That is G parietal lobe. If you're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. If you do this structure, do this uh, gesture, you are holding on to your parietal lobes. Okay. And you're like, oh, of course, of course, right? Like, like that, that's the frontal lobe that you hit it. Frontal lobe at the front, parietal lobe right here. For the most part, parietal lobe is for someto sensory. information okay so metasensory information okay. process so metasensory information so meto means bodily so you know feelings uh, not not feelings as in like emotion feeling but like feeling from like your skin okay like temperature pain pressure texture all that stuff that's called so metasensory Somatosensis, okay? So your parietal lobe is responsible for processing that. Temperature, texture. What else did I say? Uh, pain. Okay. That happens in the parietal lobe. So separating the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe, you're gonna have your central sulcus. Now this next part is a little bit confusing. Uh, so please pay extra attention. Located at the back of your frontal lobe, right in front, of the central sulcus is going to be a special gyrus. A gyrus is a bump, okay? There's a special bump right here, okay? This bump is called the precentral gyrus. Okay. Makes sense, the name, it, it's, it's a bump, it's a gyrus. That's in front of the central sulcus, so precentral gyrus. And then behind the central gyrus, you have another bum. This other bum is called <clears throat> the postcentral gyrus. So does that make sense? No, not, nothing confusing at this point. I just wanted to show you the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. Now here comes the part that might confuse you, and I'm totally running out of space here. Uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna write it up here. Okay, sorry. Okay, so the precentral gyrus contains contains the primary motor cortex which enables voluntary movement okay the cortex is referring to the gray matter and and you know you have different zones in the in the brain, um, different cortex, different cortical region that are dedicated for specific function. So on the precentral gyrus, that's where you will find the primary motor cortex, okay? So in, in a way, the precentral gyrus would be a description of like the region, the name of the region, 
whereas the primary motor cortex is referring to the function aspect of this of this part of the brain. Okay, like a loose analogy would be like you know, uh, the presential gyrus is like saying Scarborough. Okay, and then the primary motor cortex would be saying like Centennial College, which is found in Scarborough. Okay. So this primary motor cortex is a functional area that is found along the entire precentral gyrus. And that allows you to move body parts. I'll elaborate further in a bit. And then over here, in the postcentral gyrus, contains the primary. somatosensory cortex. Which uh, allows sensation, I can say, I guess we can say. Okay, or feelings from skin all over the body. And again, when I say feeling, I'm, I'm not talking about emotions, okay? That's another part of the brain that we'll look at. These are touchy feelings, okay? Like things that you feel with your skin. Now, I hope you're still with me. Yeah, you might still be copying stuff, but, but just, just pause for a second and listen, okay? Let's go back to this diagram that we had earlier. You don't have to go back. You can just watch, okay? Remember, you touch that hot surface, and it's going to come in at the end, and then it's going to go up the ascending track, right? And then it's going to go to the brain. But where does it go? Well, now we know. Because it was... Um, a uh, burning feeling, right? Hot temperature, maybe a little bit of pain. That's going to go to the uh, primary somatosensory cortex. Okay. Then it will process that information. It'll be like, oh, just burn your hand. It hurts. Okay? It's too hot. And then to decide what to do, that would be a voluntary thing, right? Run it under the water, put ice on, those are all voluntary. And that would originate from the primary motor cortex. Okay? So all that sensation, all the feelings that you get from touching the hot surface, ultimate destination in the brain is going to be the primary somatosensory cortex located in the parietal lobe. And then deciding what to do with it, you know, voluntarily, that's going to coming from that's going to be coming from the primary motor cortex. Okay. Now. The, um, th this is the left half of the brain, right? So the primary motor cortex here is going to be controlling the voluntary movement of the right half of the body. Whereas the uh, primary somatosensory cortex here is going to be um, processing feelings from the right half of the body as well. Okay, so it's it's opposite, right? Because the those those tracks, Ascending, descending tracks, it crosses the midline at the at the medulla oblongata down here, right? Another thing to know, and again, we'll explain it in greater detail next class, is that the um, the presential gyrus and the placental gyrus is is zoned into different uh, parts so that each zone corresponds to a particular uh, body parts on the other side. 
Okay, you don't have to memorize the the which area is which. I'm just going to give you a few examples. Okay, so for example, like this this would be for the hand. Okay, and and this would be like you know for the for the face. Okay, and then you would have the leg that's like higher up. But let's just use the hand and the face as an example. So to feel your left hand, uh, sorry, to feel your right hand rather, this is the left half of the brain, right? So to feel the right hand, if, if you poke your right hand like that, okay, with something sharp, then this part of the brain is gonna light up. You're like, oh, I feel something sharp, okay? I feel something hot, I feel something coarse, okay? Something um, cold, whatever the case is. That's the part of the brain that will process it. And then to move it away, to you know, move your fingers and all that stuff, that would be coming from this part of the precentral gyrus. Same thing for the face. Right? If, you, if you feel the uh, left side of your face, the right side of your face rather, right? something cold touch your face, that's going to be processed by this part. And then to move the face, right? to you know, fake a smile, right? to uh, blink your eye or whatever, right? that, that's going to be this part of the of the brain. So if someone, if someone has a stroke, say here, oh my goodness, what did I press? Hold on, hold on. There we go. If someone uh, experience a stroke over here, let's the stroke damage this part of the of the brain. What's the consequences? Well, the person will not be able to feel the right side of their face, but they can still move it. Okay, they can still move it because this is not damaged, right? On the other hand, if you, uh, if the person has a stroke over here, that damage the uh, the front part, then they will not be able to move the face, the right half of the face. They can still feel it, okay? And so sometimes you see people with such a way, they, they have like a, the face kind of droop down a little bit, right? Because they have no muscle tone to it. They cannot move it. Do you understand? So that's that. Any question? Great. Just a couple more things and then we're gonna... Uh, and today there is another one, another um, sulcus here that separates the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe. That is called the lateral lateral sulcus. Sometimes it's sometimes it's called lateral fissure. It doesn't really matter. Just I'm just showing you in case you see a different name when you read stuff online and then you're wondering who's if there's any difference. Okay, so that's that. Uh, and like I said, that separates the frontal lobe from the um, temporal lobe right here. Okay, so um, temporal lobe, just to keep it very simple, uh, is responsible for hearing stuff, processing like auditory information. Uh, as well as smell. Okay, auditory and olfactory information. We're gonna learn those names later. Just keep it simple: hearing and smell. And uh, finally, we have another thing right here on the back here. This is the occipital, occipital lobe. So what sense is missing here? We, we have basically most of the senses, all the senses, except for which one? Eye. Yes, for sight, that's right. So this is for vision, vision. And there's this little part of the brain here, 
for some reason, it's always brown in, in almost all the textbook diagrams that I've seen. That is the cerebellum. Okay, which we'll talk about later. Just label it for now. Cerebellum. Now let's see if we can find the cerebellum in some of the earlier diagrams that we've done. So here it is, the cerebellum. So the fourth ventricle is directly in front of the cerebellum. It's sandwiched between the cerebellum and this oval over here, okay? We might as well label it right now anyways, okay? The, the oval right here, Oh, that is called a pons, which means bridge. Okay, so between the pons and the cerebellum, you're going to find the fourth ventricle. Uh, let's go back here. Uh, you can see a little bit of the pons right here. On the bridge. What does a bridge do? A bridge connects. That's what the pons does. It connects different parts of the brain. More on that later. So the question says, label the diagram below. In addition, at the Brockers area and the Wernicke's area, we're going to talk about that next time. Uh, it will be too much to go through it now. Okay. So that's it uh, for today. Okay. Good luck on the quiz next. Uh, I mean, I mean, on Wednesday. Uh, I'm probably going to like go a little bit early on Wednesday. Let you go a little bit early on Wednesday to, to do the quiz. We definitely, most likely, will not be able to finish uh, lecture six on Wednesday, but that's okay. Right? Uh, we, we can do whatever we don't finish, we can finish next class. Okay, thanks again. See you all on Wednesday morning. Bye-bye.